It is vain to say that people are staying away from churches because they do not like our preaching. They are staying away not because we preach a bit of sacrifice, but because we're giving a kind of sociological drivel to often. We are here to develop the art of preaching. I am begging you also to develop the art of being a preacher. And the art of being a preacher requires, first of all, that we begin to preach to the world Christ and him crucified. Bishop Sheen was a man of conviction. What he preached, he believed. And, and that's why he came out with such force, you know, because it came from the heart of someone who really believed it. He was telling you exactly what he believed. To understand Fulton Sheen, you have to understand the place of the Catholic Church in the United States of America in 1950, in the post-World War II period. Sheen was part of a, an explosion of Catholic life that probably represents the zenith of immigrant Catholicism in the United States. The Catholic Church became a beacon of light because the disaster that had been visited upon Europe by World War II had produced such a corporate gloom in the world that, uh, as is well known, people began looking for God. He was always aware that um, people have to be persuaded that the faith is not a sentiment, it's a fact to which we must adjust ourselves. He was able to show that the mysteries of the Catholic religion complemented human life in the way in which the Thomas taught that grace perfects nature and he did it with an ease that was remarkable. Sheen showed himself very aware of the human condition, but always more aware, as any preacher should be, of the power of the divine condition, which we call the gift of grace. Are we dropping Christ and him crucified? Was this not also the problem of St. Paul at one time in his life? He made his way to the university town of Athens, talked in the marketplace where he was somewhat ridiculed. But Athens is described by Luke as a town where everyone loved novelty. What better then to invite Paul to Mars Hill? This is one of the greatest opportunities that ever faced St. Paul. To address the learned philosophers and statesmen and wise men of Greece. Talking to wise men, one must be wise. Since many of those who sat about him were university professors, and were the inheritors of the great philosophers of Greece, he became philosophical. And he spoke of God the Creator, God the Providence, God the ruler of history, and then he ended up with a word about the resurrection. And they said, that's all. We will hear you at another time. The sermon was a failure. 
Paul never once mentioned the name of Christ. He never once spoke of the cross. Pope Benedict XVI says, uh, in effect, that the aim of preaching is to tell man, is to tell the human being who he is and what he has to do to be himself. The aim of preaching is to tell man what he can base his life on, what he can live for and what he can die for. Preaching is the primum officium. That's the, the primary office of the, of, of the priest. The priest is not ordained only to say mass. The primum officium is the prophetic office, the teaching office, the preaching office. The scripture says, you know, how can, how can they hear without a preacher? The priest has to proclaim the gospel to bring people to the altar. The old saying is that there are two kinds of preachers or act two kinds of public speakers in any order. Uh, those who have to say something and those who have something to say. And at the Mass we have something to say. We have the most important thing to say. This is the good news. Preaching for the Catholic has to A, bring to the obedience of faith in the living Christ who is known only through the articles of faith and that has to move them, move the person who hears the preaching to uh, the sacraments of the church. The preacher has to begin by letting people see their glory and that, that the God died for them in Christ and, and that's why, that's why we should shun sin. Uh, not because we're breaking, breaking a rule. After all, our Lord's not a policeman, he's, he's the Savior. St. John Vianney said, I do not know which is worse, to b drop the Blessed Sacrament on the floor or to not pay attention to the Word of God when it's preached. That's very strong language. And uh, he wasn't denying the unique presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament, but his point was that it's the Word of God which brings us to the sacrament. Without that, we don't understand what the sacrament is. Preaching is sacramental precisely because it, it delivers to us the self of Christ. It delivers, it generates his life in us and precisely in the way the sacraments do, through matter and through word. Paul now shakes the dust of Athens off his and he walks 40 miles to Corinth, and he had plenty of time to think of why his preaching was a failure. And he wrote it to the Corinthians. Here he was going not to a learned city, but to a corrupt and vile and degenerate city. And to the Corinthians he spoke about the foolishness of men who believe that their wisdom is true wisdom. That really the foolishness of God is the true wisdom. So he said, I have come to know among you from now on nothing but Christ and him crucified. To preach Christ crucified is to declare why Christ came into the world. But we understand the cross now through the resurrection. After all, there are a lot of people crucified in history. But the horror of crucifying the perfect man is what has to move souls. And that's something that cannot be avoided unless we want to avoid reality. 
To hide the cross is to hide Christ. At one point uh, in her writing, Catherine of Siena uh, puts this question to herself. What is the most fundamental truth? And she replies, it is the fact that we were loved by God from the before the beginning. And most powerfully, of course, it is in the cross of Jesus that um, that truth comes home to us. And that's why it is a joy for the preacher to preach uh, Christ crucified and to proclaim also what you might call the truth and mystery of our own uh, Christian experience. Christ living his life in each one of us and the profound pastoral mystery of that life, that death, that resurrection. While the preacher has to be aware of his sacred responsibility in that moment, he has to be very careful to remind himself that he's just a mouthpiece, a megaphone for the Lord. He has to be very careful not to be interference in the sound of our Lord's voice. The preacher must become a humble disciple of the Lord. He must in some way have begun to surrender his life, not just his thoughts. What the saints and the sinners have discovered over the years who are preachers is that to bring your weakness to the Lord, to be honest and to seek forgiveness, when you do that, the Lord uses your weakness in the most extraordinary way. The old saying, cupio dissolvi, I wish to disappear. The preacher has to disappear, so you don't see the preacher, you don't think of the preacher, you uh, listen to what he's saying. I remember Cardinal Sunens in Belgium said that a man came up to him once and uh, after a talk he had given and said, Your Eminence, many years ago I heard you preach and it saved my life. And he asked him where it was, when it was, and the Cardinal couldn't remember anything <laughs> that he had said. And he said, well, what did I say? And the man said, well, you stopped for a moment and said, that's the first part of my talk. And now I have to move on to the second part. And I thought to myself, well, that's where I am in my life. I've had my first part of my life, and..." Now I really have to think about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life or it's all over. Everything that my mind needs, everything that my heart needs, everything for which I'm languishing inside is given to me, not in an idea or in a project, but in, in the event that, that transpired on Calvary and is still happening in every Eucharist, in every, every Mass, in, in the very um, lifeblood of the Church. Blessed John Henry Newman has a very striking passage. He says that the young preacher, if he has never suffered, when he preaches, he will be automatically preaching about himself. But let his heart once be plowed by some keen grief or terrible sorrow, and scripture is a new book to him. So much of the challenge of preaching is to bring people face to face with the fact that that they have this need, that they have been unsuccessful in fulfilling it, and it's not because they need to have a little bit more money or a little bit more pleasure at something, but ultimately they need something infinite, and the infinite is not something we can manufacture or invent. It has to be given to us, and has to be given to us from the place where the infinite lives, and that's heaven. We have in the world, therefore, the crossless Christ and the Christless cross. First, we have Christ without his cross. And that is too often the Christ which we preach. Emasculated. Weak. A defender for the most part of political 
economic or social doctrine. And this is why our preaching fails. And the feminine Christ, who never deals with guilt or sin, but just supports our positions. We use him instead of him using us. If you reduce the faith to mere moralizing, you've taken away redemption, salvation. After our, well, our Lord heals the blind man. He says, now go, don't tell anybody. And they go out, of course, they, they tell everybody. And not, not the first time people have, or the last time people have disobeyed our Lord. But our Lord's point was, you know, he, he, he does this out of mercy. He f heals their physical sight, but he's come to open the heart so that we can see God. And that's what the preacher has to get across. And the moralizers who've reduced the faith to mere moralizing then effeminize. After all, if our, if our Lord were passive, he would not have had a passion. There would be no reason to kill him. Our Lord didn't go around just trying to tell people to behave better. He showed them the, the dignity, the sacredness of the human soul. Moralizing preaching will say, you must do this, you must avoid doing that, and if you don't do that, you're going to suffer the consequences without ever saying, the grace to do this is available, it is for you. Christ personally is making it possible for you to change in a way that you would never imagine yourself changing as Peter himself experienced and that all he's begging of you is to surrender to this mercy which is greater than anything that you can do on your own so that he can change you. The great flaw, and I think the fallacy of moralism, is to propose that ultimately Christianity is about behavior instead of about being. What was the first word of our Lord's public life? That's the key to preaching. It was come. Come. Come to me. Be inflamed with my truth. Be on fire with my love. And what was the last word of our Lord's public life? It was go. First we come, then we go. If we do not draw our knowledge, our love from Christ, say, and then the Holy Spirit coming, we have nothing to give the people. So we have to first come to Jesus, to be given the message, to be given the life, to be given the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we can go. The preacher has to be able to say that and have people follow him. And when he said, come, he didn't say, oh, come, I'm going to go here, because they said, where are you staying? He said, well, just come. He didn't tell them where he was going. He says to the two men on the Emmaus Road, how is it you didn't understand what was going on? And he preaches to them there. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? When you're sent, you do the will of the one who sends you. And so that's what Bishop Sheen was saying. We don't go out there and preach our own gospel. We don't preach our own message. We have to preach what Christ and the church give us. That's why we come first to learn these things. Then, once we're formed, we go. You turn from Peter denying Jesus at the fire to the very first pages of the Acts of the Apostles, and there he's preaching with this amazing force and authority, even in a way that would make you think that he was uh, that he had never done anything wrong because in the course of the sermon he says you crucified the author of life well if anyone was guilty of that it was peter himself for denying jesus but the people are so moved by this they come up to him at the end of the homily you know, the, the sermon and they say tell us what to do and they are so captivated not simply because they've been taught something but because they've seen the one who has enabled this ignorant fishermen 
to be on fire with God's divine word that they want to become that way themselves. After the resurrection of our blessed Lord and the Pentecost, we're led before the Sanhedrin, and they spoke with power, and they spoke with eloquence. And what did the leaders of the Sanhedrin say? They said to them what our people must say of us. They have been with Jesus.